Welcome again to the fourth tasting we've had. And thank you all so much for being here. Um, so let's have a toast to all of us. Uh, Votre Sante. <laughs> I didn't hear anybody else. Somebody Votre Sante. Yeah, there you go. Others, you out there? Uh, I think Brad just finished his entire glass of wine. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Very good. Uh, if you're not going to talk up, so I think we got a great show for you tonight. Very interesting subject matter. Excellent, uh, excellent ones tonight. I, I think you're going to love it. I'm all fired up myself. A couple of housekeeping uh, items. Uh, as before, we're going to have a what we call an open mic, or you can unmute yourself all the time, anytime. Um, and, and that's, uh, you know, just please observe some courtesy for others that are speaking, but, uh, we do really want you to participate, ask questions, make comments, correct Thirsty and myself when we make an error, right? Thirsty. Uh, you know, that's, that's the fun part. I want to learn. Yeah, well, what do we know? Right. <laughs> so, um, thank you all for being here and thank you also for the surveys you've answered it's been very helpful we're going to try to address everything that we've seen in fact we're executing on three of your uh suggestions right now one is for us to have some white wine we're having white wine tonight as you can see second is to have a different grape i'm sorry same grape from different regions so we're going to do that number three and num number three we're going to have pairings we've got them tonight we put them out to you in our uh, blast, and uh, we're going to have a talk about pairings. We're going to work on pairings. <clears throat> we're going to ultimately, we hope, uh, pair you up with some restaurants that provide the food that we're, will match our wines. So we're moving on with your um, with your suggestions, and we thank you for them. There's one I, I want to address that we're not moving on to, and that's the early start. Um, some people would like an earlier start, as early as six o'clock. Um, the shop uh, is open until 6.30, so that's a bit problematic uh, just for pinch fine wines. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's also um, just uh, hard to get everything uh, done. And most people in our surveys, 70 some odd percent, prefer the sort of 7 o'clock hour. So, so we, we're probably going to have to stick with the 7 o'clock. We urge you to get your food early and, and, and have it at the house and, uh, and begin uh, uh, having your dinner while you're having these wines. So we're going to try to tell you every time what wines we're having and what might pair well with it in advance so you can make that very easy. Okay, um, so we're going to, let me tell you what we're going to do. We're going to um, have our uh, sip of wine here in a minute, uh, Thirsty and I, and we're going to talk a little bit, just a few minutes, about what we're tasting, what we're seeing. Um, and then we're going to let Shelby uh, Mackey, who, as you might remember, if you were on last time, <clears throat> saved my bacon while I was messing with uh, with technology. He stepped up and told you one of the most difficult subjects of all, and that's how how champagne is made. I mean, that's a it's a great way to start, Shelby. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I had fun. Well, it's, it's a hard subject, really, to do well, and you did well, and and you stepped up. Shelby's on our team at Finch Fine Wines, um, and we're delighted to have him, and he's doing a great job for us. Then we're going to um, do a quick, uh, brief explanation of the theme, which is the uh, Judgment of Paris. It's a very interesting event in history. Lots of things to tell you about, but I will be brief talking about that. Um, then um, we're going to have uh, Thirsty more uh, Thirsty uh, talk to us about uh, the Bottle Shock movie, which was uh, built around the Judgment of Paris. It's a great movie. I hope you've seen it. If you haven't, you should. I saw it again last night, probably my third time. It's a wonderful movie, it really is uh, fun. Um, and then we'll have another round of talking about the wines um, and then we'll open it up to questions and comments. And uh, we do want questions and comments. We need it, we need participation, it's very important to us. Yeah. So um, with that, I think we'll go quickly to a, a first taste. I'm gonna taste the uh, Chablis and talk about it for just a couple of minutes and then uh, Thirsty's going to speak up about the uh, Char uh, the Chardonnay. Okay. All right. Away we go. So, um, looking at this um, beautiful Chablis, which I think is a lovely wine, 
I think you can tell, particularly if you compare it to the Chardonnay, it's got a little bit of a green tinge to it, particularly on the edges. Um, and uh, so that's, my, that's the first thing I look at, of course, is the color. It's very clear, absolute crystal clear, uh, you know, pale gold with a little bit of a green tinge, uh, I think. Um, then we do the nose, of course. You got to get your nose right in there. This is a great, uh, great nose. And a great glass to have it with, as I mentioned last time. This is the one that we have here at the shop. You, again, it, it, it concentrates the nose right up here at the top. And this, I think, it's got a great nose. It's got intense minerality to it. It's got tropical fruit, I think, for me anyway. Mm -hmm. um, lime and lemon um, in the nose. Very pretty wine. Got a little bit of a taste. I urge you all to follow on. Mm. I like that. Um, I would consider that to be a medium bodied wine. Um, it's elegant to me, um, uh, very precise, it's got some fresh acidity in it, um, maybe a little. Uh, of the lemon and lime flavors that I talked about, certainly mineral kind of flavors. Mm -hmm. It just makes me think of the seashore. I can hear the ocean roaring. Um, you know, we talked before about the fact that uh, Chablis and, and Burgundy, generally speaking, are underlined by limestone, as is uh, Champagne. And that minerality, I think, comes through. You can taste it all the way on the back of your mouth. Um, it It's maybe a little got a little more acid than fruit right now. Pretty young wines, so that's not surprising. Um, but uh, the fruit will uh, will out over the next year or two, I think. I think this wine is will uh, plateau in about the years between 22 and 26. Frankly, I love it. So that's my story, Scott. Yummy. Yeah, yeah, cheers. That's a, yummy. that's a great wine. Um, what's interesting is, um, is uh, you know when I when I taste these uh, and I, I'd love to get feedback and we will um, you know um, it's so neat to see a really cool climate uh, Chardonnay like one from Chablis and then you go over to what is a really cool climate in Sonoma County I mean th these grapes are just a few miles from the ocean and it's for Napa and in Sonoma California this is a really cool climate Chardonnay but it to me um, it has some of the same properties, but still, it's a totally different wine to me. Um, you know, uh, when I look at the color, um, you know, it's definitely not Chablis. To me, it, it's uh, got a little bit more of a honey color. I, I actually got a little kind of a, a hint of brown in it. Um, and um, I'm not sure if that comes from uh, some of the, the winemaking techniques. Yeah. You know, sometimes they can do a little kind of reductive winemaking, which gives it a little bit of that tinge. But to me, it's just got a little more uh, color on it. And it may be very well that it's from a uh, slightly uh, riper fruit. Um, but um, when I, uh, you know, on the on the, the aroma of it, to me is um, I get the, a, like a citrus, like a zest, uh, zesty citrus, but a, but a creaminess. It's, um, you know, has a wonderful, um, wonderful nose. And then Yeah, that, that taste to me, I get that green fruit, kind of tart apple, Granny Smith apple. Um, um, to me, uh, it's funny, I find the, um, the uh, Chablis has a, a little more ripeness to it. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say this isn't ripe fruit, but to me, it's, um, the fruit is, is more green, but it's got that freshness, that bright acidity. But to me, I, I can feel it immediately in my tongue. There's a roundness to it. Um, um, I'm sure probably from uh, some of the malolactic -like fermentation that it goes through. I know that uh, the winemaker, um, Aaron Jordan, is, is big on that. It's, it's got some oak on it, um, so it helps to kind of soften and, and um, give some roundness to it. But to me, it's a, it's a really delightful wine. And uh, as far as, as, you know, California Chardonnays go, um, it's got nice balance to me. It's not uh, too high in alcohol. For that fresh acidity, that good fruit, and I, I agree with you. 
um, uh, Ed, this wine as well could um, could last a bit longer, and some of that fruit will uh, eventually, um, as it as it uh, settles in the bottle a little bit, I'm sure will will come through. But a delicious wine, very food friendly. Yeah, I was surprised by the color too, Scott. You know, you typically think that <clears throat> that might be a wine that's oxidizing some. Yeah, uh, maybe yeah. older older wine, but it's it's not. Of course, it's an eight, 2018 as yeah. well. Um, and we'll talk it's about the oak. It. Yeah, well, we can talk about it. But, you know, one of the unique things around this wine, which we'll get to, is that um, um, while um, um, Fela makes some really, you know, very, very elegant um, uh, single vineyard wines, the Sonoma Coast um, project that they have, uh, he really fools around with a lot of stuff. So pieces and parts of these um, lots where they're sourcing these grapes from, some of it's done uh, fermented in stainless steel, some of it's fermented in concrete, some of it's fermented in big um, uh, Fudra, like thousand liter uh, uh, giant um, wooden uh, casks. I mean, he, he uses a lot of different techniques uh, to, to create these wines. So that's what I'm wondering if, if something in the winemaking technique is, is uh, giving it that color, but it's, um, it tastes, I don't taste any oxidation. There's, it doesn't seem off. It's a, Really, very no. clean tasting wine, but the color is, uh, you know, different. Okay, well, that's a quick, brief uh, uh, description of these wines. As far as Scott and I can tell, I will remind you that whatever you taste, whatever you think it is, whatever you want, however you want to describe it, is fine, is right. Nobody, wine tasting, wine drinking is totally subjective. And uh, it's what you remember that matters. So um, you may not taste the flavors and things that we do, but uh, it is, you know, we're not right about it. We, we just, that's just what it is to us. Yeah, I agree, um, Ed. I mean, I know you stress this every time we get together, but wine tasting is, that's what makes it so wonderful is it's totally subjective. So um, this is one of those times when we love to get feedback um, because we're all going to experience different things. Absolutely. Um, speaking of learning different things, we're going to let uh, an ask, uh, that is, uh, Shelby Mackey of uh, Finch Fine Wines to talk about the pairings. This is, he's our resident in-house uh, expert on this subject. And so, Shelby, if you could talk about how these wines uh, go with uh, what they go with best and, and what they bring out, it would sure be terrific. We've got a slide coming up now that... Um, uh, describes that and, and by the way we're, we're again you you'll be sent all of these slides that's why we're we're uh, putting these in so you can you don't have to take notes we, we got all the information right here for you thanks Ed uh, one of the things that I think is important and I think this group that that we got meeting every week is a little more inquisitive and uh, we'll go into a little bit of why this stuff works as just that it works. So as uh, Scott and, and Ed mentioned, you're dealing with a leaner, more mineral, um, lighter, slightly lighter bodied wine in the Chablis and a, uh, a rounder, more full bodied uh, and actually butterier wine with the uh, California Chardonnay. And there are reasons for that. In the case of the Chablis, it mentioned in the uh, previous slide that it, there's Kimmeridgian soil there. And where the, uh, the minerality really comes from is the, um, the fossilized oyster shells. You, you heard Ed mention feeling like he was at the beach. Well, that's where that comes from. For me, when I uh, first put a nose to the wine, I felt like I was smelling a stone and it, was just that that was the first thing that, uh, that occurred to me um, happens in um, in Chablis is that it's pretty far north it's about 45 miles northwest of what most people consider to be the northern reaches of Burgundy it's about 45 miles northwest of uh, Dijon and because of that yeah, it's cool weather, a cool climate. That generates a lot of acid along with the, uh, the very basic 
soil and in the in basic in terms of a chemistry the soil is very basic the uh, weather is cool gens a lot of acid a lot of minerality and because of that the um the wine is going to pair best with things that are mildly flavored uh it it will make raw seafood raw uh oysters paired shrimp and scallops and shellfish it will make those guys sing and the reason is that acidity and the minerality complement uh, the the lighter flavored seafood also works really well with a uh, mildly prepared fish think for example a uh, a cod or a haddock with a um, an herb prepper or a lemon herb maybe some garlic maybe some light butter will uh, will work really really well with um I, in my research on this i found that uh, the burgundians actually pair it with a mild version of ham which that, that surprised me a little bit but they've been doing this for hundreds of years so i have to uh, have to defer to, to them on that if you're looking at cheeses it's probably going to be best with something like a feta and the reason for that is the feta's got a little bit of acidic tang to it and acidity in the wine the tang in the wine is going to come really well uh, goat cheeses and swiss cheeses will also work well with this and then we switch over to the um California wine and this is where both the terroir and i'll get into that in a second and what goes on in the winery are just different it's not better or worse it's just different that's why these two wines are different uh terroir most people think of it as just the dirt and that's certainly part of it but it also includes the climate the uh specific weather they had that year it includes uh, the aspect that the uh, vineyard faces the sun from whether it's on a hillside or flat whether it's on the east side or the west side all those things figure in it's really more a sense of place and in of the uh, Sonoma coast you're talking about something that's a little unusual in the U.S. country and that is a, uh, a wine a vineyard that's pretty close to the coast and it gets these cool ocean breezes all the time so it's a lot cooler than you would normally think from it and those pieces bring in a salinity that that struck me here one of the differences between stereotypical french wine making and stereotypical california wine making is that the french believe the wine happens in the vineyard and the Californians believe that that's all well and good, but we can do a lot with it in the winery. And that's what uh, Scott was talking about, the malolactic fermentation, um, the fermentation uh, in, um, and in my research, I found the wine goes 60% into uh, older oak, not first use oak, but uh, you're gonna get a lot of oak in there. For me personally, the thing that struck me on the nose was, and that comes directly from the malolactic fermentation that Scott mentioned, who increases the alcohol content there. But um, where it really figures into the pairings is because now you've got a little bit of a smoother mouthfeel. Glycerin is probably overstating the, the case, but just smoother. And you've got some butter in there and you've got a little bit more body. And so you've got a wine that will stand up to maybe instead of a, a lemon butter sauce, maybe we, we can now do a beer blanc on cod, and it's gonna work really well. You can do a, a buttercream sauce on, uh, say, chicken tenderloin. Absolutely fabulous. The best meals I ever had was a buttercream sauce on breast chicken and bones. <laughs> it was just and uh, that's why all those things come together to make these two wines different and the pairings for them different it comes from both the dirt and the, uh, and, the winery. and uh i guess I'd, i'll end it with that with the uh, california 
you're going to be dealing with something that's a little bit more fuller bodied. It'll stand up to, let's say, a tuna or a salmon with a cream sauce that maybe would be a little bit too much for the, uh, for the uh, Chablis. Cheeses are actually pretty similar. Uh, sheep's milk works really well for the, uh, for the Chardonnay. Also, you can do uh, some good Italians. Uh, Pecorino Romano and um, uh, Parmesan will work really well with the uh, Chardonnay. And the reason for that, again, is the Chardonnay's got a little bit more body to stand up to it. So that's a little bit on what they pair with and a little bit more on why they pair with different things better. So you can go out when you're in uh, bench wines and you can uh, pick out something on your own that you think will go well with what you're having for dinner tonight. So Shelby, what you're saying is that your job is to make all of our mouths water. I mean, I, I just want to hear you rattle off those um, wonderful uh, recipes. Uh, I, yeah. yeah. And, we, and when are you going to send them over to us? Yeah. Well, um, my wife made, my wife Deborah made um, a lemon shrimp pasta tonight oh, that was yeah. fabulous and really works well with both of these. Personally, I think it probably goes a little bit better with the Chablis, but I kind of lean that way myself anyway. So uh, whatever you like, that would work with either one. Yeah. All right, thank you, Shelby, very much. Um, so we'll talk about the theme of tonight's uh, event. This is the Judgment of Paris. This is a very, very interesting uh, historical event. Actually occurred uh, in 1976 on May 24th, um, and it was put together and organized by a very entrepreneurial guy named Steve Spurrier, not the Florida coach. This is an expat from Britain who, uh, who moved to France and uh, got into business over there in the wine business. He, and he had a shop. He, had a, he was a partner in the restaurants and did a variety of things in the wine business and was, of course, an accomplished wine taster himself. But his shop was not doing particularly well. At least he wasn't selling any American wines. And he liked American wines, actually. And uh, so he, he and his uh, associate, Miss um, Gallagher, who I'll talk to you about in a minute, um, who um, got, came up with the idea to have a, a uh, tasting, a comparative tasting of American wines and French wines. And they, were, they, they determined, that, of course, they'd take the best wines. So they'd have a white Burgundy, with, which is 100%, as you know, Chardonnay grape in, in Burgundy. The, the uh, Burgundies in, in, in that part of the world are, are generally speaking, 100 and um, uh, and uh, compared with American Chardonnays and the Bordeaux, basically Cabernet-based Bordeaux, compared with the Bordeaux of California. So in on, on May 24th in uh, 1976, they assembled a a, a, a extraordinary panel of judges. Uh, nine of the 11 were French. Uh, the French were not adverse to, to rigging the deal. And so they had nine French French judges and two, um, and one from America who worked for Steve Spurrier in his institute that he created and himself. So 11, 11 people tasting wines. Uh, when, they, when they aggregated the scores, however, they eliminated the scores from uh, from the American uh, lady and from Steve Spurrier. They only had French judges judging these wines to make sure that it worked like it was supposed to as far as the French were concerned. And um, so um, we'll give you, show you a little picture here of the, um, we got the judge, the picture up of the judges. Here we go. So there, there are the judges. This is an actual photo from historical records. You can see them all lined up at the table there. Um, and uh, you can see this fella. Um, right here, here, this fellow right here is um, is is sw swishing the wine around in his mouth as you do at a tasting. And they got all the glasses lined up uh, along there, and uh, and it looks like a very wonderful time. I'm sure that's probably the first phase, probably in 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. They broke for lunch and then had a wonderful afternoon of tasting red wines. But uh, so. Um, 
they had this event and brought in California wines and the judges, as you can see, here's, here's a list of the judges. You got French judges, except for the American lady, Patricia Gallagher, who worked for, who worked for Steve Spurrier and Steven Spurrier, the only two non French folks, the rest of them were either in, in the wine trade or talked about the wine trade or wrote about the wine trade. I mean, this is about as rigged a deal as you could possibly have. And, uh, but, the, but the Americans, always willing to go into the breach, uh, showed up with their wines and uh, presented them, and they were tasted blind by the tasters. And, um, and so the, the, they did not know, the, the people tasting the wine did not know what was being poured. You can't really see it very well in this picture, but the bottle this fellow is pouring it appears to be wrapped up as it should be, so it was, in fact, a blind tasting. Well, things didn't go quite like the French anticipated. So when they got through tasting and uh, uh, recording all the scores and, and figuring them up, it turned out that the results were for these white wines, as you can see here, that Chateau Montalino from California was the number one wine, rated by nine French judges, much to their chagrin. And uh, Merceau from uh, Monsieur Rouleau, his Charm Vineyard, was number two, but America took three of the first four and four of the, of the top six wines, just destroying the French um, belief in the superiority of their white wines. In fact, in this tasting, uh, one of the ladies, the other lady in the tasting, uh, one other judge, other female judge, tried to get her ballot back so that it wouldn't be, she, nobody would ever see how she voted. Um, and uh, it was just a remarkable event, a wonderful victory for the United States in 1976, which by the way, was our bicentennial, bicentennial year, uh, our 200th anniversary of 1976 uh, creation of America. So, so this was just a great uh, and, and unbelievable uh, event for those times. Hey, Ed, uh, and, this is Bill. I hey, Bill. What, what what would you say was the impact of the judgment of Paris? That's a great question, Bill. Um, thank you for asking. Uh, it's um, it it was a great event and short term event really for America in the sense that it was a marketing victory. I mean, it it told the world that American wines were really fantastic, and so it, to that extent, that was a great impact uh, on American wines. It certainly cre uh, created markets for them and helped them penetrate other markets. For the French, it was a quite different event. It was embarrassing, but what they, the way the French dealt with it, as they sometimes do, um, they ignored it. They basically didn't believe it and they said it's not true. And we, you know, some, something went wrong and had all kinds of excuses. Uh, in fact, they required a retaste. Ten years later, there was a second. Uh, second version of this and the American wines won again. But what it did do on a long-term basis is it woke up the French, particularly in Bordeaux. Um, you had the Garigist, Gar Garigist, Garigist uh, movement move, moving along and a lot of people began to do more things that were better for 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 the uh, French wine making industry, it was a real change in direction. Beginning of a real change in direction for the French, so it was very good for them. The, the French had been doing all kinds of funny things for years, particularly in Burgundy. They would um, uh, blend their Burgundian wines with North African wines and Rhone Valley wines, and uh, in the 70s, and got busted for it. So, so this was a wake up call to to, to for the for the French, uh, and they. They did respond to it, just took them a little while to get around to it. And Ed, let's also not forget that it was only a few short years later that the uh, French began investing heavily in California. Um, you know, they partnered uh, uh, with Mondavi on that Opus One project early on, but then, you know, the French began to um, uh, sniff out property there in Carneros and all over. Uh, both in Sonoma and Napa, and then, you know, went up the coast to uh, Oregon. So uh, they, they, um, they, they got hip to, uh, to the, the, you know, the terroir that, that uh, some of those early pioneers had, uh, had explored for sure. 
Right. It was, it was a it, long-term benefit for, for French wines. Yeah. Short-term embarrassment. <laughs> and I think it also gave a lot of permission to other New World wineries to step into it because, you know, in South America, they've been making wines, you know, for, you know, post-World War One, World War Two, when you had a lot of those Italian um, and French immigrants that went to Chile and Argentina, but they'd been really focusing on bulk wines. And a lot of that wine uh, was not exported. Um, and if it wasn't exported, it wasn't thought of as quality wine. And I think it, it slowly pulled back the curtain on other regions to be able to really double down and make high quality wines. Um, you know, it gave them the confidence for uh, like, you know, the Catenas in, in Argentina, for example, that, um, you know, they, they, they worked with a lot of French winemakers, but they also, uh, you know, took a lot of pride in, in, um, and their terroir and their winemaking techniques, and they became, you know, world-class uh, Bordeaux-style winemakers as well. So I think it had uh, rippling effects over the the next decade or two. It, it did, and also in Australia, it allowed yeah. the Australians oh, to begin sure. to move into the marketplaces as well. It was a real um, event for wine in the wine world, a real um, earthquake. Okay, so. Um, from this event, this historical event, a movie was made called Bottle Shock, and it's a great movie. I hope you have seen it, or if you haven't seen it, I hope you do see it. I, I watched it again for the third time last night. It's just a fun, fun movie. But what it's about is the star of the uh, uh, Judgment of Paris was was um, uh, Montalina's Chardonnay, and this is the story of Montalina and what how they how the, how they came to uh, win this award. So. We're going to let Scott walk you through that. It's a great story. Yeah, it is. I, I, and, great and, movie. Uh, um, for those of you who have seen it, uh, you can appreciate uh, Alan Rickman, who plays Stephen Spurrier. And um, I, I think, um, like, like any um, good, uh, you, you know, satirical, uh, in many ways, retelling of the story, you know, it, it, it uh, really dials up, um, you know, his... Um, his stodgy Britishness, but I think Alan Rickman is, is just plays that part perfectly though. I've never um, <laughs> met Steven Spurrier, but I, I want to believe that he was, he was like that, which was, um, he just couldn't help his Britishness, but underneath he really was a, a very sweet guy or is a sweet guy. But um, yeah, this is definitely um, a, a, a kind of a, a Hollywood retelling of, this, of the story, at least from the perspective of Chateau Montalina. Um, you know, and you got to keep in mind, they've got to pack this into 90 minutes, two hours. So they've got to uh, embellish some areas. They've got to combine some storylines. They've got to combine some characters. But, but generally speaking, um, it really was, uh, and Ed pointed to this from the get-go, if nothing else, you can turn off the volume on this movie and just soak in the beauty of, of Napa Valley. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous. And um, that part of Calistoga uh, where Chateau Montalena is, and um, you know, particularly in these days, was still very, uh, very rural. And I mean, these people were farmers. Um, you had, uh, you, you, you had um, folks like the Mandavi brothers that were there in the 60s that were you know, exploring wine, but certainly it hadn't really come into its own. These were um, mostly gentlemen farmers um, who were uh, just trying to um, you know, practice their craft. Um, they, they weren't looking to, you know, for, and they really couldn't get it, you know, wide distribution. There just wasn't that appetite for California wines, but, um, but you really, uh, the movie really encapsulates the, the, what was going on in Napa at that time. And, and um, you, you know, you've got that whole storyline um, of uh, uh, Jim Barrett, who uh, was the owner of Chateau Montalina at the time. And, you know, though they really um, add some sizzle to that, you know, storyline between he and his son, Bo, um, you, you know, what you, what you realize is that, you know, he, he, um, he was very serious about his winemaking and uh, they were creating some really phenomenal wines there. And, um, and you, you, you got that. Um, I, I think, you know, to me, one thing that, um, even for those of you who have seen it um, and those of you hadn't, I think the, the one piece of embellishment that, that really um, sticks out to me that I think is important for everyone to know is that um, perhaps the, the most important character in this whole um, process of the judgment was left out, and that's Mike Gergich. 
Um, and for those of you who know um, those wines that Gerga Chills has produced over the years, I mean, he is not just a rock star in the pantheon of great uh, California winemakers, but I think he's recognized around the world as one of the true pioneers of, of, the, of the modern winemaking era. But, but Mike Gergich was actually the winemaker at Chateau Montalina who made that 73 vintage that went on to win. Um, and um, for some reason, I, I, he didn't want to participate in bottle shock. So um, the, the storyline is that, that Jim was the one who, um, who uh, shepherded that vintage along. But, but, um, but short of that, you really do see a lot of those characters that, um, you know, Gustavo, who's the, uh, the uh, Mexican-American gentleman who partners with Bo, um, they actually really were best, you know, really close friends in real life. And, and Gustavo actually worked with Mike Gergich early on and then went over um, to uh, Gergich Hills um, and had a great career after that and is one of the first um, really um, um, you know, uh, groundbreaking uh, Hispanic winemakers in California and has gone on to do um, really great things. But I do think it, it really shows um, how... Uh, unexpected it was um, for uh, for what they were for what they were doing in California at the time and and um, it wasn't just Chateau Montalina but you had uh, Shalom uh, Vineyards which was just uh, south of um, San Francisco you had folks like Freemark Freemark Abbey uh, David Bruce I mean you had a lot of a lot of folks who were who were trying to make really high quality delicious um, expressions of Chardonnay as well as Bordeaux style uh, reds. And, um, you know, there's a lot to learn if you love wine. And if you just, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I, I've seen it a few times. I've, I've seen it once where I'm having a glass of wine. I've seen it just when I've had a, a rough day and I love for some beautiful eye candy, but I definitely would, would see it. The characters are rich. And um, like any good story, uh, whether you're, you know, catching a fish or, you know, whatever, whatever. I mean, it, it's the tail kind of grows and, and that's the beauty of it. But, it, but um, at the end of the day, um, those pioneers, early pioneers in the mid seventies in California were, were really setting the stage for what turned out to be an explosion, right? In the, in the coming decades and, and set the table for, um, for what is, you know, those great benchmark Napa uh, wines and, and also in Sonoma County as well. One of the interesting parts hey, of that story. Yeah. Yeah, Ed, I had a question. Um, for, first, I wanted to say I, I also love the movie. It's, uh, it's, it's just greatly entertaining. And, yeah. um, you know, the, the focus on the wine and the winemaking process is wonderful. But um, my question is, you know, on that, that table you were showing, it, it kind of showed the... Um, winemakers, but what about across the judges? How consistent what were the, the scores um, across the, the nine judges that were, you know, compiled into those scores? In a word, they were inconsistent. <laughs> yeah. It was remarkable. It was just that they were all over the lot. Uh, Chris, thank you for asking the question. It, it demonstrates our earlier point made about, about how one, nobody's wrong about wine. I mean, they, the, the, the best uh, Bordeaux was uh, Montrose, and some people ranked it at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, some of them ranked some of the worst, uh, in, that's in the, in the, in the uh, red wine. But, but they were just totally, totally inconsistent. You couldn't find anybody that was even close uh, in, the, in the rankings which just demonstrates that wine is subjective and it depends on what you, what you like and what you think and what you perceive and how you feel that day. Uh, yeah, so it was very different. Add another that's a great question. Add, which, which I had to remind myself of. I hadn't realized this, um, but, it, but it also turns out, and, and you know, uh, I don't know how many of you are statis statisticians, statisticians, but um, when I was reading about the actual literal scores, that um, again, it just shows you what a marketing ploy this was and how it was, as Ed was saying, it was really rigged to be a slam dunk um, for the French and a complete slam against the bicentennial for those, you know, uh, you know backwoods Americans. But um, there wasn't a consistent um, score in terms of um, one person might have been grading on a scale of one to 10, 
Another judge might have been scoring on a grade of, of one to 20. And so, the, I, I mean, again, I, I haven't facilitated many contests, but even the, the actual, the way that they scored there, there was inconsistent, though they were able to kind of total everything up and divide it and, and, and kind of claim a winner. But it was, um, th that just shows you how much confidence that the French had that it would be no contest, that it would just be a runaway win and, you know, it would be, um, you know, 100 to zero. Uh, it was really fascinating. Yeah, several statisticians viewed the results and rendered the opinion that it was just BS. There was just no, there was no validity to, the, to it from a statistical point of view. Yeah. It, so, but it was great. It's a great story. Yeah, it and, really and, is. And um, one of the other interesting things about, about, about Bob Jock was that <clears throat> apparently, and, and Scott, you may tell me about this or anybody else, it, it appeared in the movie that um, Montalina was on its last legs financially yeah. and, and that this tasting absolutely saved the business it was it was Jim uh, was at uh, allegedly of course probably embellished it, as many things were that Jim Barrett how was at, a, at, at a, a new employer's job he was seeking a job when they when he got the news that that the wine had done so well yeah yeah he was some um, I think um and Ed you can appreciate this you know he, he had been a, a pretty successful attorney and he had quit law and um, you know as, as the movie would have it he kind of went back to the law firm with his tail between his legs, um, assuming that they would have him back as a partner. And you see in the movie, as you know, that they um, they say, well, hired a, you know, happy to bring you back, but, you know, not as a partner. And that's when he has that revelation that, oh, my passion is wine. And that's when he discovers that the wine actually, um, you know, that enzyme, enzymatic browning, it, it was clear and everything was fine and have the, you know, the happy ending. Um, but, um, yeah, I, my, my take is that, uh, Jim is a very sharp guy and, um, probably, um, you know, I, 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 you know, like a lot of those, a lot of those early winemakers and even today, I mean, it's an agricultural business. So very thin margins, you have a bad vintage, you, you probably are back at the bank wanting to, um, make sure you've got a line of credit because it's so capital intensive, but I don't know how, um, desperate they were where it really was where they were on fumes and that's what, you know, Time Magazine called and suddenly they could, you know, make more wine. But it, it's, it sure was a fun ending. It was great. Okay, well, we'll move along to another uh, taste here real quick, everybody. I hope you've been drinking throughout this, uh, this, this event, not waiting to be asked. California. Yeah. I'd love to know what, um, what, what other folks are having alongside i mean shelby really kind of um piqued my interest in some of those wine pairings i'd love to know what others are having with it whether it's cheese or whatever you're nibbling on and what you think about it if someone's willing to share that with us okay um the uh the chablis well both of these are delicious yeah. uh and matter of fact while Shelby was talking about the foods i was thinking oh yeah i can see that that'd be good uh and we were thinking like the Chablis would be very tasty with uh, some crab, you know, with like say a lemon butter sauce, something like that. Um, the uh, the failure uh, has a, a good, uh, I mean, they're both, like I said, both wonderful. The, the Sonoma Coast, uh, does have a richer flavor. I think that glycerin that, that he mentioned in the mouth makes it uh, better suited, like say for something a little heavier sort of fish, uh, or with chicken would be would be wonderful. Yeah, roasted Both chicken, very good. roasted chicken with that. Oh yeah, chardonnay. some roasted chicken yeah. with chardonnay would yeah. be would be very very tasty. Also, uh, had a question, kind of going back to to the tasting, the judgment. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the even though the the range of the vintages there mostly were seventy threes, like maybe a seventy two and a seventy four in there. But do you think that the vintage, primary vintage, in the two countries involved, if that affected the outcome? And I, I think that might be even more evident in, in, in the reds. But but uh, you know, just looking at at, at the whites. 
What, yeah. what, what is um, your take? Yeah, you're you're right. I think about that, uh, Gramps. Um, the French had had several wonderful white wine vintages, uh, Chardonnay vintages, um, started well throughout the 60s, 61, 2, 4, 6, and then 69 was just unbelievable, both uh, red and white. Uh, I mean, I still remember drinking those wines. They were among the first wines that I learned about, I learned about wines through. They were fantastic. 70 was a light vintage in, in the white uh, Burgundy. 71 was a, uh, and so not very um, profitable. It was not a wonderful wine. It was just sort of a, it was a good one. And then uh, 71 was a really small crop. There had been terrible frost wow. in the uh, vineyards in 71. And uh, so they had very little uh, uh, grapes uh, when when they harvested so so they didn't make much money in 71 either and and then along came 72 and it was horrible they it rained all the time during the harvest uh, season and the the gripe the grapes never ripened so the the ones that they brought I think it was uh, Le Fleuve had a 72 uh, in that uh, uh, in that uh, uh, that it pr presented for that tasting, and it it had to be awful. You just couldn't make good wine. The grapes didn't didn't ripen. Seventy three was not a great uh, white wine vintage either. There were a few people, like always, who made some good wine, but it was not a great great vintage. Whereas in um, California, seventy three was an excellent white wine vintage, and seventy four. There was just that one from seventy four Shalone, I think, was the seventy four. Uh, um, and, it, and of course, that was a great vintage for red or white. Uh, but uh, and '72 was not particularly good, and there were a couple of California wines that were '72, uh, but they they scored lower. So I think yes, the French got got kind of unlucky, or perhaps they didn't even care. They just were sure they would win and didn't didn't pay any attention to it. And uh, if they if they could have rigged it by changing the vintages, I'm sure they would have. But um, I think that did make a difference, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Ed, um, there's a, a question on the group chat from, from Jay. Um, he was asking about the, uh, the, the phenomena that happened for the discoloration in the, in the movie. Um, and that really is a, a, an actual, uh, something that happens during the winemaking process. And, and uh, if you've seen the movie, um, it, it kind of comes out in terms of what happens. But... Um, one of the one of the processes that Mike Gergich used when making his Chardonnay is um, uh, he had a, um, a this process of a reductive process, and that just means when you uh, make uh, or make or a bottle wine in a in a, a zero oxygen environment, um, and sometimes a, a reductive you know uh, you know wine it can cause some um, some really off flavors, but in this case um, there's an enzyme that um, in the presence of oxygen um, doesn't turn brown. In a, in a reductive environment, it does turn brown, but it goes away um, shortly thereafter, usually in a couple of days. And that's what was happening in this wine. And um, um, Gergich knew that uh, in, the, in the movie, it's really played up to be dramatic where the whole entire vintage is lost. But um, it's, um, it's actually a, a result of that, of that um, very precise, um, specific way of making uh, Chardonnay that that Gergich used at, at Montalina. Hey guys, so this this may be a curveball, but um, we talked about the ten year redo of this, and that the Americans won again. Yeah. Getting back to the same question, so do y'all happen to know what the ranking was, and then like what the what were the scores more consistent with the judges or? I, I can't remember right offhand, but I do know that the American wines won in uh, the second round. But I can't. Uh, that's that's my that's my recollection as well. I, um, Sarah is looking it up while we talk, but um, and we'll give it to you. But I think I think Montalina was again the top on the Chardonnay, and uh, I, I can't remember the other order. I, uh, but we'll know in just a minute because this my expert over here is going to have the answer. <laughs> Yeah, that was, so I was sorry about that curveball. And by the way, we're having cod and squash casserole. Oh, that's oh, great. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have to say, Shelby, you mentioned uh, Pecorino uh, going well with, um, with the, um, the uh, Fela. 
I thought about, um, made me think of um, that phalo with um, some uh, risotto with a little uh, shaved truffles and pecorino. Um, I could have that with a glass of wine and just go straight to bed and be a happy camper. Be a happy man. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. We, we, just, we just had a question from Brian Wade about whether these wines would improve. And um, I'll take the first part of it. I think the uh, Chablis will improve uh, over the mm. next couple of years. Its its acidity, um, I think, is is uh, inhibiting the fruit at the moment. I think in a year or two, it, it'll turn around and, and be a little better. I, it's, I think it's oh, great right now. So, but I, but I think it will be a little better uh, in a year or two. I think it'll reach a plateau, as I said, in 22, and be good for on that plateau for another four years after that. Um, but I, I, yes, a little bit better, but it's great now. I would not hesitate to drink it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, but, the but the Chardonnay, Scott, your thought about the Chardonnay? You know, I think it, to me, um, I think it's, I, you know, I, I would say candidly, I think it's, I think it's made to drink now. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's, um, I think you could, there's, there's, uh, plenty of acidity, um, but I, but it, it, it feels like to me that uh, through the winemaking process, through the what they're doing with their barrel program there, or lack of barrel program, and the way they're blending, um, it makes me feel like they're, they're creating this wine for you to enjoy it now. I'm sure you could um, uh, cellar it for a couple of years. It, it might, um, you know, the, the, the uh, acidity and the fruit might come into slightly more balance, but to me, um, I mean, look, it's priced right. It's wonderful, wonderful with food. I, I think you, you, you buy this and you, you drink it now. And if you wanted something that was maybe a, a, a fairly, uh, like a, a slightly more serious expression of their single vineyards, you might step up to one of their uh, um, single vineyard Chardonnays or, or Syrahs or Pinot Noirs and probably have something that could have some age to it. But uh, I mean, I, I think this is very drinkable right now. Ed, to uh, your uh, description of the aging potential of the Chablis, uh, Alan Meadows, the Berghound, even suggests that we don't start drinking it until 2024. Oh, wow. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. I, I can see that. It, it would take, take, take a while for this acid uh, fruit uh, situation to evolve. So now I've got to buy another bottle and and. and uh, hold it for a few years. A bottle, did you say? Oh. You meant a case, didn't you? He meant he meant case. Yeah, yeah. I thought he meant case. I thought he meant that. Um, I, I, we, um, I saw a couple of questions. Brian Wade had another question. I, I, it's gone now from my screen. Brian, can you tell us again your, your question? Yeah, I was just asking if we didn't want to drink both bottles tonight, like the red wines we've had have gotten better after a couple of days. Will these continue to do that same thing, or will these lose some flavor with just a day or two? That's a great question, and thank you for asking it because it reminds me to say again that you know we're drinking young wines here, and uh, it's all right to put a cork in them and put them in the refrigerator, and they will be better the next day. That is certainly true for the reds. I think they can be good for a day or two. Uh, certainly, the whites. You know they're going to go a little more quickly to the to to um, to suffer a little bit for but I, I certainly a day but you really the best investment you can make if you want to drink wine is this vacuum in deal and the little cork you can put in it you can pump that air out uh, it's great I, I mentioned before I use half bottles uh, as the way to do it so you have even less air in the bottle to start with I, you know if, if you really, everybody should buy those. They're great tools to give you longevity for a bottle you can't finish. It's just wonderful. They're very economical. I, I mean, you can get them at Dead Bath and Beyond. I mean, it's they're real easy to find. It's not a fancy tool, but it is. It's one of the. And, best and we have it. At the, we have it at the shop too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, there was another couple of other questions we've missed. Let's see. I think both of these wines really are going to work well with food. So because they are young and they both have some great characteristics. So I think that just drinking them alone 
probably doesn't show off as much probably as it would the food comparisons and, yeah. and with food. So uh, really both great wines. So I think with food, they would be exceptional. Mm -hmm. I agree. You're hundred percent right. They're, they're, your food and wine go together. Food, wine, and friends. <laughs> Hey, so uh, Ed and Scott, this is Adam. Um, you know, for, for a very long time, I was convinced that I just didn't like Chardonnay at all because, you know, I don't like big butter bombs and, you know, it just it wasn't my thing. I, I, on the white wine side, I, I'm drawn more towards, you know, acid, you know, the acidity of a, of a Sauvignon Blanc or something like that. But then when we started drinking Chablis, I realized you know, it, it's actually not a bad grape. I really love it. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I think it, it, the acid really shows in this wine, and it, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Try a really good white burgundy because I'm telling you, that is flexible with a lot, a lot of stuff. It is a wonderful pairing with tons of things, and it's really good to drink out on your back porch as it's tipsy and you had a bad day. So. Yeah. And Adam, I would say, you know, um, I, I would second um, Shelby's um, suggestion of, of, of a white Burgundy. Um, I know Ed is a huge fan of, of Burgundian wines. They have a great selection there. Um, I, I would say, candidly, just stay away from a Chardonnay that's made in warm weather because the warm climate is going to suck all the acid out of it. It's going to um, make super ripe fruit. And, um, you know, it's going to be high in alcohol. It's going to be kind of out of whack because of, the, of, of just how much sugar that they have at harvest. So um, if, you, if you like a good, great expression of that grape, which you're seeing in both of these wines where you get that crisp, you know, Granny Smith apple, but you have the inherent acidity in it, you know, stick with, with expressions of that grape from, from cooler climate where they, you know, can let the grapes ripen longer it keeps that freshness and man they're really food friendly because even when they're crisp and and have that freshness like the chablis they're inherently more have more body than a sauvignon blanc or a pinot grigio or pinot gris just because of the grape so there are some foods like these amazing chicken dishes and fish dishes that we're talking about with these sauces that just cry out for a chardonnay but it, they don't always have to be big, oaky, you know, 16% alcohol. Um, and they, they're, they, so um, give, give those a try. And these are two great places to start. I second that emotion. Absolutely. Uh, and as to the uh, question about the uh, retaste, the, the white wines were retasted in 78. Um, you know, they don't last as long, so they, they didn't wait. Uh, for 10 years they were retested in 78 or t and uh, the top three wines were Chalone, Montalina and Spring Mountain Valley. Right. The uh, Pouli Mont Rocher came in fourth. So yes uh, they did it again in uh, for the white wines and they they did actually the 10-year taste for the reds and a recent uh, not really recent but somewhat recent 30-year taste. We're going to talk about both of those in part two next week when we do the the red wines. And um, Johnny Roberts, um, the least educated on, of on your boat on our oh, boat. Right. <laughs> Sorry, okay. we Does arrived a little bit late. Um, we're, we're on Lake Tuscaloosa on our boat, oh, yeah. but um, least educated here. The question is: um, Are the um, the wines that are um, the French wines, have they been hurt by the fact that the California wines finally got some recognition or did it enhance their business? Uh, yeah, are you saying recently, the last several years, last 20 years or so? Well, I'm just saying in general, when they did the wine tasting, you know, this was probably something that shook their world, you know, when yeah. this came out, this wine tasting. I'm curious also about um, the story, because we've watched that movie a, but a lot of times, <laughs> let's just say, but um, many times, was it really that prevalent? Was, it, was, a lot of people knew what was going on, or was this something that was just a movement that took time, and then also, 
did it really help the French wines in the long run? Yeah, yeah, it 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 was immediate. The uh, the French press, of course, ignored it for years. Uh, the American press actually there was only one one uh, reporter, only one reporter at the tasting. That was a Time magazine reporter, um, right. and and there was some press in the in the U.S. for a while, but but it did take time for it to have a real effect on the French wines. They they were slow to change. You know, they had centuries of history and, and tradition, you know, particularly in Bordeaux, uh, where you had the 1855 classification that we talked about before. Those guys just said, hey, we're second growth. We don't give a damn. You, you need to buy our wine. Um, and, and that prevailed for a pretty good while. It, it took a while for that to get, get upset. But finally, it has made a lot of difference. Wine, wine today, Bordeaux, wines you bought in Bordeaux in the 1970s, um, were there's no, they just don't even compare to what they what they're producing in small uh, chateaus today in in uh, in Bordeaux. They're just so much better. It's a, it's an ocean part different. It's just incredible. So it took took a good while for it to really make effect in, in France. They resisted. You know, the, as you might expect. Well, it's kind of like car dealerships. They all put themselves next to one another. You know, um, you know, does that help French wine sell more wine? Um, you know, when they're compared. Well, they, they sure didn't have a whole lot of competition, and I think that's to Ed's point. I think um, when you talked about some of the kind of shady practices they've been, um, you know, uh, using in in Burgundy, for example, uh, you know, when you don't have competition, you can you know cut corners. You you can uh, get a little lazy, and they did, and and they've had to up their game, and uh, you know, I mean, it's it, they've they've had to up their game, and and Ed's right. If for those of you who were here uh, uh, when we did the Bordeaux tasting, and you had some of those uh, examples from the left and right bank, I mean, it's Ed's exactly right. Um, I mean, the, some of the wines they're producing now, they've they've really had to. Um, be much more in tune with with uh, with consumers than they were back in those days. Where if you went to a restaurant, you just had a, a French wine, and that was all that was to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being on, everybody. Um, how about some more questions or comments? So I have a comment. Um, I did a little bit of research on the Chardonnay beforehand, and I read that this particular winemaker uses a native yeast for the primary fermentation, and that he also lets it complete the malolactic, I guess, without any additional inoculation. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I thought it was very brave, and I was just wondering how, com how common this is. I actually used to brew beer, and I was a microbiology major, so the, the whole concept of just leaving it up to nature completely blows my mind. I can't imagine letting whatever's hanging around just inoculate your wine. So I was wondering what you think about that. How common is this? And how do you think it affects the character of the wine? Well, I, I mean, I would say that, um, you know, he's, he's kind of splitting the difference between uh, very uh, traditional winemaking and kind of the natural wine movement. He does use native yeast. And so, um, you know, native yeast by their, you know, very design are, are more unstable than um, a, um, a commercial yeast that they might inoculate, um, you know, to kick in fermentation. Um, and there's probably, you know, like, like lots of things. Uh, it probably adds um, a lot of character to it. And um, something tells me, though, just given the, um, the level of, of, of his wines, that um, they're, they're, it's a, it's a very controlled process. I wouldn't say that it's, um, um, you know, uh, a, a natural process like you would see in, in more of the, um, um, some of these um, kind of that natural movement, but, um, but, I'm, sh but I'm, I'm, I'm sure um, that it does add uh, character and uh, uniqueness and, and, you know, as a, another expression, I'm sure, of the, of the terroir, just like the, just like the soil and, and where they're sourcing the grapes from. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Uh, Thirsty's right. Um, 
There are, however, more and more people using native yeast uh, that's used in champagne now more than ever before. It's burgundy, and uh, it is, it makes sense. It, it's the yeast that's supposed to be there. It's the one that ought to be in the, in the wine. It's what, you know, years ago, the way it had to happen, they, they didn't have commercially manufactured yeast, so they had to do it. Um, it there is some risk taking, and so what the vintners who have used it do is they they'll, they'll try it with just a few of their barrels of wine for a while and see how it works and taste and and not gamble the whole crop on it and find out okay well maybe that patch over there on the left is not one we ought to get but this one on the right worked pretty well let's try it. so it's a process but I think it's a, it's a makes perfect sense it, but it's it is still in its developmental stage as as Thirsty is suggesting. Yeah, and the other part of that um, too, where where you're where they're really experimenting is that what they'll tend to do on the back end is maybe add a little sulfur dioxide um, just to make sure that everything's clean and there's no um, funny business uh, once the wine starts to age and you know there's no chance of uh, another fermentation kicking in unexpectedly. So it's um, yeah, it's it's definitely um, something they're experimenting with. Great question, Barbara, as always. Hey, we've talked a little bit about it, and, and you hey, may have hey, already. Bradford, tell us why. We got this. James Bradford, we lost you. Yeah, I'm not in a boat on Lake Tuscaloosa. I'm in my bathtub on Redmond, uh, but I'm kidding. The, I'm kidding. The, joke. That's the joke. I just want to know who's with you. I, I know that they made the movie out of Montalena. Tell us about Shalone and why we don't see that in the local market. I don't know if it has to do with ownership or whatever. Uh, part of the Foley I'll, I'll, Empire, but I could be wrong about that. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll deal with that. Um, Shalone was a, was a wine that I loved. Their Chardonnays and their Pinot Blancs were just yeah. outstanding. Uh, in the 70s, and then in the 80s, they had a very bad patch. Um, they had a lot of mold in their cellar, and it got, in, as it always does, into the wines, and for, I think, three years, they produced some really awful stuff and refused to uh, reimburse anybody for it. Oh, and, boy. of course, uh, so, of course, it just killed their sales, and, 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 and people just haven't, I, I have never gone back to it. And I don't, I don't even know what, what they're doing today. I'm sure they solved the problem and they're making good wines, but it, they have, it, it has been a real burden for them forever. That's a great question. Yeah. Hey, James, don't mix the bathtub water with the wine, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Martha, um, I just saw for a minute her question. Anybody can see that or can, Martha, can you ask, ask us again? It wasn't a question, it was just a comment <laughs> to you that we've been on the, uh, the Zoom a couple times, but today was really our first time in the shop and we had a lot of fun and there were some great finds. I didn't know well, you great. were gonna, I didn't know you were gonna call on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't embarrass you. But thank you so much. We appreciate you coming in and appreciate your patronage and appreciate you being on tonight. Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. And thank you. Your choice of, your choice of wines were very good here. Uh, the Chardonnay from California. Uh, we lost. Yeah. We lost somebody. Who do we what lose? Kind of Who? Who do you? Okay. We, we, we lost Close, you there. Were you trying to say something? Price Close was trying to say something, I think. Price. Earth Price. He's driving in a car, but he was texting a question. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. Please Somebody don't do that. For him. <laughs> Pull over. <laughs> He so didn't he's sign the, texting and driving. <laughs> he's not drinking. He didn't. He didn't sign the Finch Hold Harmless form. <laughs> That's right. Very good. That's right. Damn it. 
So, so texting, driving, and drinking, that's an interesting combination. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I have a question, uh, Ed and Scott. Um, we've talked a little bit about it, um, you know, over the course of the tasting, or, or, or we've at least mentioned it. But could you explain just exactly what the process of malolactic fermentation is and um, do you only see it with Chardonnays or do you see it with other varietals? <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> um, I'll yeah. take a little bit of it, Scott, bit, let yeah. you have a little bit of it. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, go for it. You start. So, so, so after the primary fermentation, you it depends on the wines and the country and whole host of factors, you do have sometimes malolactic fermentation. And um, I think that is not uh, a, uh, uh, an alcoholic uh, conversion type of reaction. It's more of a, a biological reaction. The yeast is not involved and it, is, and it does provide when that happens that um, malolactic acid is converted and which generally presents itself therefore afterwards as a, a smoother uh, and you get some buttery kind of flavors as a result of that. Some people block it, some people encourage it, some people just let it happen or not happen. Uh, it's a, an interesting uh, and often discussed and, and disagreed about uh, uh, a reaction. Scott probably yeah, has a whole lot more information. Yeah, yeah, so it, you know, what it does um, is, is just as Ed said, it, it, it takes the sharp edges off of the natural acidity in, in grapes. And so um, it takes the malic acid, which is one of the primary acids in grapes. That's what gives you, that's what makes your mouth water. And it converts it into lactic acid, which is much softer. And as Ed was saying, it's more round and it creates that creaminess. And if you let it, if you let the fermentation go to its natural conclusion, you do get some of that buttery quality. Uh, but the most important thing you need to know uh, relative to your question is that um, it, it, malolactic fermentation is across the board, mostly in red grapes. Um, it's not just um, exclusive to Chardonnay. Um, it, most of the red wines that I, I bet, I mean, I don't know, I'm making this up. I, I bet 75, 80% of the red wines that we drink go through malolactic fermentation and you feel it on the palate, but you don't recognize it mostly because tannins are gonna be more um, pronounced than that creamy and certainly any of that butteriness. But um, a lot of these red grapes that are naturally high in acid, Cab is one of them. Um, it goes through malolactic fermentation uh, to create that, that softness. And um, I, I mean, it's, it's um, I mean, it's it's just one of those things that, that's omnipresent in, um, in in winemaking. It's it's one of those tools that's used in conjunction with kind of barrel aging that that gives a winemaker a tool to soften uh, you know soften out the wine. Yeah, that's totally correct and wonderfully said, uh, Scott. I 100% agree with you. I bet you 70 or 80 percent of the red wines go through that. Yeah. It just kind of gets a bad rap, for, uh, you know, for many people because they think about buttery Chardonnays, and um, and so, uh, but but malolactic fermentation is not a bad word. I mean, it's a it's a when handled, uh, you know, appropriately, uh, it's it's a you know important tool in all winemaking across the world. Sarah says that both of these wines tonight have gone through it, and she would know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. All right, and we got some more questions or comments. I, I know we're, we're keeping people, but uh, I at least am willing to stick around. I think we can persuade Thir Thirsty. He's still got some wine in his glass. I think we got him for a few more minutes. Yeah. And, I taste uh, a little bit of honey at the end of the Chablis. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Malolactic, malolactic uh, what's happened there. Yep. Yep. Just at the end. And also, I would just like to add that the Chablis pairs well with truffle fries. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's just dirty. That's wrong. You, you decadent person, you, you're not having <laughs> truffle fly, fries, are you? Oh, yes. 
you've been quarantined too long, obviously. <laughs> oh, that's all popcorn. Oh, yeah. Yes, it does. That is, I'm serious. That's, that's yeah, what we were having. It does. It's delicious. Yeah. Chardonnay and yeah. popcorn are a classic pairing. That's uh, right. Uh, so you're, you, you know, either one of these, will, you know, and I've also been told that um, uh, wavy lays or ruffles and Chardonnay are also a good pair. Mm. But anything that's got some fat and salt and a little bit of that, uh, yeah, I, truffle fries, come on, that's just wrong. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's unfair for the rest of us peons. That's right. My, daughter, my daughter's a, a, a rich person and she, she can afford to do it. Oh, now let's just, no, 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 no. But do you remember, Daddy, it was a um, Chablis when I called you and told you the wine was so good I wasn't going to brush my teeth that night. <laughs> oh man, that's the quote of the night. I, I love that. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, we've had some good ones. That's a classic there. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? Truly. Ed, you did this um, uh, back at the at the Bordeaux tasting, but um, I, I'd love for, uh, for us to have a um, kind of a, a non scientific poll to see which wine uh, folks preferred, if there's a way to, for, for people just to kind of throw it out uh, now that you know, you've had a chance to explore both of them. Yeah, I think it's, that's terrific. Um, you know, we've got one for Chablis, a couple of Chablis. Walter Gower says it's Chablis. time. Chablis. Yeah, wow. Chablis getting. There you go. Chablis getting. Okay. Chablis getting a little, yeah. French are winning tonight. Yeah, this is James Bradley. I think the Finch wine wins at all. Ah, there, there you go. go. Ah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Spoken like a true neighbor. <laughs> hey, Ed, uh, one thing that I, I actually have a question. Um, if, if I wanted to uh, learn a little bit more about Chablis, uh, what other examples do you have in the shop that um, that are that you uh, like that might be uh, splurge worthy or uh, another kind of special bottle? You know, um, I can't uh, see them from there. Yeah, uh, Sarah's going to go over there and look real quickly for us. Because I'd love um, to know uh, the next time I'm in there, um, you know, just to see what what you prefer or what you what you think is a something we should we should know. Well, I, I will see if we get an answer to that. But you know, the problem with Chablis is the same problem we have with white burgundy. You just, it's just so expensive today. This, yeah. this wine that we're having tonight is an, another steal. Um, it, it's just, it's rare to get a, a white burgundy costs $30. It's, it's this good. I mean, it's just, you can't find them anymore. It's really and hard. It's a premier too as well, which is, which is really a, Pretty special, pretty special wine for for thirty bucks. Yeah, it's it's crazy. They, they, these kind of wines, you know, go for hundreds, yeah. hundreds of dollars today. They used to. No, they didn't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are a couple of uh, Montrachets, uh, Pliny and Chassagne Montrachets that now Elizabeth Spencer had Chablis. Right they are, they're not inexpensive. Okay, Elizabeth Spencer Chablis. Well, I won't do that. But. I'm going to challenge yeah, you on Carol, that. Carol Ann here. Uh, you know what I, you you know what I always ask every time? Always go by their wait, 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 wait. We, we have several people talking at the same time. No, honey, Let's they go. had a Chablis. Somebody needs to mute. Somebody needs to mute. Somebody that doesn't know they're, on, they're not on mute. I think you're right. Uh, all right, Carol Ann, I think you're on now. Well, I ask this every time, but what's next? Uh, next week, we're, we're going to do the second half of the uh, Judgment in Paris. So we're going to do uh, Bordeaux versus uh, California Cabernet. Oh, that'd be fun. Wow. That'd be fun. And we, we'll reveal the results of that uh, at that time and, uh, <laughs> and also be drinking those wines. It'll be fun. We'll be here. So in general, Good. how have those wines paired up? Today, you know, um, Chateaumont, Plain, Chardonnay. I mean, are they equal to their quality then? 
for the help around. So, I'm sorry, Johnny. Say that again. I was asking about the Ch Chateau Montelay and um, Chardonnay that won. Is it? I've not thought of it as one one of the wines we try to buy these days. Oh, you know? oh yeah, oh yeah, it's great. In fact, we have in the shop the 2012 Chateau Montalina, and it's wow. wonderful. Hmm. It's really good. These yeah. folks have made great wine, you know, since they got since '73 on, um, yeah. and it's not too bad, really. You, it's sixty-four dollars a bottle, which for the quality compared to a French white burgundy is again another great deal. <coughs> Fantastic. Bo Barrett still involved? His yeah. son uh, runs it now. My assistant, who Sarah, who knows Bo. everything, Bo. is yes, Bo. the son. Bo is, Bo is the son. Yeah, no. yeah. Bo is the son, and he's he's running it now. Bo is still running it. Okay, good. Yeah, he he gave up his um his long hair and uh, hippie ways and no no Allman Brothers soundtrack on the. <laughs> there, there, there may be Carol Ann, but I but I I, I know that I, I think he really um has uh, picked up the torch from his dad and, you know, as, as you know, like we all do, we kind of grow up a little bit and get a little more serious. But I, I knew he took it over. I just didn't know yeah. whether he was still doing it. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he grew up and figured out he needed the money to, to do the things he wanted to do. <laughs> That's right. That land got, that <laughs> land and uh, those houses got real expensive in Napa real quick. Yeah. Wow. Hey Ed, we um, we went to Napa Valley on our honeymoon and uh, wow. a tasting at Chateau Montalena, and it was it was awesome. It was uh, we, we were tasting the 30th anniversary uh, of the Judgment of Paris because it was 2006. Oh, geez, and we were tasting. Wow. It. it was really nice, and they they were pouring both uh, the the Chardonnay and the um, Cabernet that they that they had there, and it was just it was really nice. They weren't born in the 73. No, no, no. no, no, no. Okay. I wish. I wish. Yeah. Uh, well, that's great. That's exciting. That's a beautiful place, isn't it? It really was just a, a, a fantastic. And, yeah. and, you know, the tour, was, the tour was nice, but it wasn't anything, you know, really big production because it wasn't that huge of a, of a, a, a chateau. Mm -hmm. But it was really, it was really yeah. beautiful. And the wine was beautiful. Were, All right, um, Chris Patterson is eating cheese. Is what cheese eating is surrender monkeys? What is that? <laughs> Sorry, Ed. That, what does that, that mean? Joke. Um, what does it, that mean, Chris? <laughs> it it it's a Simpsons reference. Okay. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I was actually going to say I, I love that we can hear um, the the wildlife and the bugs buzzing around. Uh, for all you people that are outside, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's good. I didn't know if you could hear that. We got a lot of froggies around us. Yep. All right. Any other questions or comments? Uh, we'd love to have them. Thank you so much. If, yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you all for being on and look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>